Now, when we examine the religion of Islam after the Holy Prophet the Holy Prophet peace be upon him, before he left in a famous statement that all Muslims have recorded, he said, I leave after me the book of Allah and my Ahlul Bayt. These are the source of salvation, the source of guidance. If you hold on to them, you will never go astray. But what happened after, after the Prophet was something very tragic and this is a common theme that we've been discussing you know when it comes to the history of the hadith, the history of Islamic law, is that after the Prophet there were two main challenges. The first challenge was that there was a ban that was imposed on the recording of hadith, the prohibition of recording the hadith. This lasted for a hundred years until the time of one of the final and last Umayyad rulers and kings, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. He is the one who lifted this ban temporarily. Of course, we had an exception of four years during the time of Imam Ali alayhi salam, in which he also lifted the ban and he encouraged the people of his time and he had scribes who would write and document the hadith. But for 100 years there was a ban on the recording of the hadith. You can imagine what happened to the Muslim Ummah at the time. This is something that history documents. Those caliphs who came after the Prophet, they imposed a ban, they gathered the hadiths that they found and they burned them. This is not some you know Shia source that's claiming this, no this is our history. I'm referring to Sunni sources here. The first Khalifa, Abu Bakr, when he rose to power, one of the first thing that he did is that he had recorded 500 hadiths, he set them to fire. Now their justification was that we don't want people to be busy with hadith and to abandon the Quran. Now this was their excuse. But for a hundred years there was a ban. The beliefs of the people changed, the new generation of Muslims, they had no clue what Islam was about. Yes, the Quran was there. It's the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the Quran, is it enough that you just give it to someone without any explanation, any tafsir, any hadith? The Prophet throughout a period of 23 years, he explained what the Quran is. You can't just isolate that. So there was a ban that lasted for about a hundred years. This was a challenge that plagued the Muslim Ummah and it had very drastic consequences on the belief system of the people. That's why you found decades after the Prophet, the people's beliefs had changed. Most people did not have a firm belief in the religion of Islam. They did not understand Islam. And hence you have a hadith that says after Imam al Hussein was martyred at Karbala, now this is, I know, a very scary hadith, but it says that there were only three true Muslims who supported Imam Zain al-Abidin, only three. Out of this entire Muslim ummah, only three. Can you imagine? That's what happened. And then in the second century, as Muslim territories were expanding, now you had the influence of outside nations, of foreign nations like the Persian influence, the Roman influence. All these books were being brought from Persia, from Rome to the Muslim world. They would be translated and people would be bombarded by these ideas and new beliefs and they did not have a solid foundation. And this created a crisis. Many people were impacted by these you know, ideologies. That's why at the time of Imam al-Sadiq you had this wave of atheism in, in Muslim society. Every day a new sect develops. Every day there's a new idea. And this was a problem. And at the same time, you had those literalists, you know, the school of hadith, like the Hanbalis, who took everything literally. They considered using, it, using reason and your intellectual capacity as something that defies Islam. They also created their own sect. They ascribed, you know, um, 
bodily futures to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and these narrations found their way into Muslim books. Until today, if you look at the Sahah, you'll find, you know, um, unbelievable narrations that God has a leg, He has a body, He sits on a chair. You know, one hadith he says on the day of judgment, God sits on a chair and God is so heavy, the, the chair will squeak. You know, when you've got new furniture and it squeaks, Yes, it will make a noise because God is so heavy and you know to the right side of God there is some room for four fingers, that's what the hadith says and that is for the Prophet, he'll sit next to God. You had these hadiths and people believed in them and you would wonder you know this is the core of Islam that there's nothing like God, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have anthropomorphic qualities, that He has no body. So what's going on here? But this is the problem, this is the challenge of the Muslim Ummah at the time. And you had by the way, the people of the book like some priests and rabbis, they found freedom in Muslim societies, they would come and spread their own beliefs. From the beginning of those caliphs, you know especially the second caliph, he really gave them a lot of freedom like Ka'b al-Ahbar who was originally Jewish. Abdullah ibn Salam who was originally Jewish. He opened the door to them to come and spread their beliefs and many of the hadiths that you find in Muslim books, they were the source of it. Especially when they talk about prophets and the crimes they committed. You know those hadiths that we have in Muslim books, Prophet Lut doing so and so, getting drunk, God forbid, committing adultery, God forbid. Who was the one who was spreading these stories, it was the people of the book. You know the, the story with Prophet David, subhanAllah, it, it, the history says Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, he was so furious with this history because they would bring storytellers. How do you keep the people busy when you've banned hadith? What are the people going to discuss? You have to give them alternatives, right? One of the alternatives was to bring storytellers. And the people of the book had a lot of stories to tell, so that's why they became prominent in, in the Muslim society. Ka'b al-Ahbar, very famous. Most of the hadiths about prophets that you find in our books, you know, with some other schools of thought, they go back to him. So Imam Ali alayhi salam, this is before his caliphate, he heard that this story was being discussed. That Prophet David, peace be upon him, one day he goes on, you know, on the roof of his house and he's peeking into people's homes. Now first of all, is this something a prophet would do? You peek into people's homes and he sees this woman bathing, she was not dressed, he falls in love with, he falls in love with her, he sends after her. Now he was the king, remember David was the king. This story is still found in Muslim books brothers and sisters. David and Uriah, you can look it up and the origin of it is the, you know, changed Bible. So basically he summons her, he commits adultery with her, God forbid, she becomes pregnant. Now when she becomes pregnant, she tells him, you know, that I'm pregnant. He realized that, you know, now he's in big trouble. So what does he do? Her husband, he was in his army, he would work in the army of David. So he sends a letter to the commander of his army, I want this person, Uriah, I want him to be at the front lines so that I'm sure he would be killed in this battle because when you put someone in the front lines, chances are they're going to get killed, right? So he has him killed, then he marries this woman to cover up this pregnancy and then who's born out of this relationship? Allahu Akbar, Sulaiman, the great prophet of God. Until today brothers and sisters, such similar stories exist in the books. You found it. Yeah, it's a famous story. You could look it up on Google. And it's mentioned in the Arabic hadiths of some other Muslim schools of thought. So you had a disaster in the Muslim world when it came to our belief system. Now who's the one who stood in the face of all this mayhem, this chaos, this corruption? The Imams of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. By raising a generation of scholars, who would protect the aqidah, the belief system. One of them was Hisham ibn al-Hakam. Hisham ibn al-Hakam, 
was trained by Imam Sadiq in theology, scholastic theology. He was the best debater of his time. If you wanted to debate Imam Sadiq first go through Hisham. If you can beat Hisham, then you can go to Imam Sadiq Many times, you know, some of these people who wanted to debate, they would come to Imam Sadiq and Imam Sadiq would refer them to Hisham. Go to Hisham, debate him. Then if there's an issue, I'll debate you. That's how powerful he was in his aqidah, in his theology, in his scholarship. Mu'min al-Taq was one of the companions of Imam al-Kadhim He was also one of the pillars of faith at his time. So we see the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, in the face of these challenges, they actually rose to purify the aqidah of the people, to purify the beliefs of the people through their efforts, through their hadiths and through their students. And it was at that time that you had a science by the name of Ilm al-Kalam that was born. Ilm al-Kalam in Arabic, literally if we want to translate it, it's the science of speech. But in reality, it's the science of theology, scholastic theology, which aims at defending our belief system and establishing proofs for our belief system. Now why was it called Ilm al-Kalam? There are a number of reasons. Uh, one reason is because at that time when you wanted to discuss theology, you had to debate and use speech. So that's why it was called the science of speech. Uh, another reason is because one of the most important debates that were being made at the time when the science was born was something the Abbasids, you know, came up with to keep the people busy with so they don't object to their oppression. And by the way, for decades, you know, the scholars and philosophers, they would debate this point. In fact, people were killed because of this point. The Kalam of God, the speech of God, which is the Quran, for example. Was this something God created? Or was this something Azali that was always with God since the beginning of existence? Some eternal, as we call it. It was eternally there. You know, they just kept the people busy with this idea. You got philosophers, they would come and debate. No, we've got proofs that the speech of God was always there with him. Some would come and say, no, the speech of God, like the words of the Quran, they are a creation of God. God existed, then he created them. That's one reason why this is also called Ilm al-Kalam, because one of those first points that would highly be contested and debated as the science was you know, in its uh, uh, early stages was this issue of kalam and the speech of God. So by the way, inshallah throughout this uh, course, you will hear the word kalam, ilm al-kalam, mutakallim. Mutakallim is a scholar who specializes in theology. Mutakallimin, in scholastic theology. So my dear brothers and sisters, this was just an introduction for us to know the importance of the Aqeedah. It represents the most important dimension in our life. And that the Aqeedah that we have today, it's a result of so many sacrifices of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and of their students and great scholars in history who sacrificed everything that they had to preserve these beliefs for us.